Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, I will try to get to as many questions as possible. But first, I wanted to say hi to you, mom and dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Hi, we're good. We're doing okay. <laughs> Actually, quite good, Heather. <laughs> good. Well, I apologize for missing you all last Sunday. I was on my way to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine annual event, and I thought I would make it in time, and I didn't. So I apologize <laughs> for missing you all, but we're here. And uh, I know you had some some things you wanted to talk to everyone about tonight, well, Dad, Dr. Mm -hmm. McDougal. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and I'll, I'm gonna try and get you to make a notices ahead of time to let people know. What I'm gonna do, Heather, is I'm just gonna go through the news and through my topics of interest, and I'm gonna pick some subject to start every every five o'clock session on, and then we'll go on to question and answers. And so I, I decided this uh, evening. There were three things I wanted to talk to you about. And the first one is about um, fatty, fatty liver, fatty infiltration of the liver. And let's see if we can get something up here. Let's see. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. But, All right. but we got to do something a little different here. Sorry about that, folks. So you're sitting there right now thinking, well, these guys are pretty low tech. <laughs> well, yeah, we are pretty low tech. We're getting better, though. We're trying. Well, I know everyone appreciates you going over these these latest studies and just sort of bringing us up to date of what's going on in the news. So I'm, I'm trying to keep people as much up to date as I can. You know, they're... Uh, so fatty infiltration of the liver has been a big topic for people lately. And it's because it's it's become so common. We're in a situation where, you know, let's say 40% of people are, are obese, another 40% are overweight. Now that fat doesn't just go to the body fat, you know, the stuff under your skin and your thighs, buttocks, or abdomen, but it goes inside also. It it infiltrates the tissues of your abdomen. You develop what we call an omentum that's full of fat. I mean, really, you go into a surgical operation and you see these bellies full of, just like you threw a whole bucket of pig grease in the belly. Anyway, the, the liver gets stuffed with fat too. Nothing special, just like your, your fat cells get stuffed with fat. You, you get your liver stuffed with fat. And people who have obesity, they end up developing type 2 diabetes and so people who have type 2 diabetes and obesity have a high rate of having their liver involved. Now, the way I used to see this is I would do basic blood tests. I would do cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And what I would see is I'd see an elevation of what we call liver function tests, SGOT, SGPT, ALT, AST. They're all abbreviations for enzymes that are released by the liver when it becomes inflamed. So the liver becomes inflamed, and we call that non-alcoholic fat and liver disease. And the way you diagnose this is you see uh, something wrong with the liver. Like I say, you might suspect it mostly on blood tests. And you start asking the patient, do you drink? Have you had a viral infection? It's non-alcoholic inflammation of the liver, abbreviated N-A-F-L-D, non-alcoholic. See, non-alcoholic, no alcohol, fatty liver disease. <clears throat> And it occurs in up to 25% of the general population. Heather, when we have a general population where 40% are obese and another 40% are overweight, I'm not surprised. And uh, when you have diabetes, in addition, you have a very high rate of, um, of this it fatty liver. It used to be that way, though. It wasn't a common yeah. because well, fatty liver disease you always thought of as being an alcoholic problem. Well, that's how you make the distinction, though, Mary, is you make, uh, I mean, when you are an alcoholic, you have... Um, inflammation of the liver from the alcohol. Yeah. But you make the distinction, you see uh, an inflamed liver and you ask the person, do you drink? And oh, they say, okay. no, you got to start thinking of other reasons. Could it be viral hepatitis? Well, you know, it's the fat and then you see that they're overweight and you see that they're type two diabetic, you go, it's got to be. It's and then you start okay. doing tests like CAT scans on them or sonograms and you see actually the liver is swollen. 
And then they get worse. They get into a, a condition called uh, steatohepatitis, where it gets so inflamed that you start laying down scar tissue, which is cirrhosis, and the liver fails, and it eventually ends up in conditions such as liver cancer. Uh, here's, a, I think, a very relieving, revealing picture of the difference between a healthy liver and a fatty liver. Yeah. yeah. You see that? Yeah. You see how you stuff the cells with fat? They become inflamed because the fat's not supposed to be in there. It's like sticking a, it's like sticking a, um, a sliver of wood under your skin. It, the fat's not oh, supposed to be in there. It gets inflamed. Anyways, uh, they suggest that it causes uh, it causes uh, insulin resistance and also may damage the insulin production in the pancreas. I don't know. Maybe. I think it's mostly insulin resistance. Anyway, when you try and treat it, uh, the way you treat it is you get people to lose weight, period. If you did something like adding olive oil or fish oil as a treatment, which this experiment looks at, it is not effective at curing fatty liver disease. You're just replacing one kind of fat for another kind of fat, maybe animal fat because you were eating cows and pigs and chickens, or because you're an animal, animal fat, you replace it with olive fat or fish fat, it still stays inflamed. All right, so the key is losing weight. Any way you lose weight, you lose body fat and you lose liver fat and you stop the fatty infiltration of the liver, any way that you lose weight. And let me offer as an extreme, low carb diets, you can lose weight. And if you lose the weight, your fatty liver will improve. Okay. Even if you're eating all this uh, um, fat. It's yeah. a good question. I mean, because you, because yeah. you're, you're eating uh, bacon, butter, brie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all these fatty foods, and, yeah. but if, just because you lose weight, you're. Well, it's enough, but it would be wow. better if they didn't. Yeah. Okay. You know, it'd be better if they didn't do it. And besides, this is the real reason you want to, don't want to take this approach is because low carb diets, here's the research for you. I want you to come back and look at this slide later on and look up the references because these are all the references that look at the dangers of these low carb diets. You know, the keto diet, uh, the carnivore diet, the Atkins type diet. These are major reviews that were done to look at the chance of dying or dying of heart disease if you follow these low carb diets. And all the major reviews, there's no exceptions. They all show the same thing. And then this recent article came out this year uh, showing that it isn't just heart patients, it's everybody who goes on these kinds of diets. And here's, here's just looking at older people or middle-aged people who went on these low-carb diets, you know, Atkins, carnivore, keto diets. And you see there that if you went on a low-fat diet, you had 18% less chance of dying, 16% less chance of dying of heart disease, and 18% chance less chance of dying overall. If you follow, that's a typical Western diet. Can you imagine what would happen if you follow our diet? So you don't want to lose the fatty infiltration of the liver by going on a low carb diet, getting so sick, going into ketosis and uh, making your body sick in the long term. You could also take these GLP-1 agonists like Trulicity and Baeta and Ozempic and Victoza and Mojaro. You know all the names, Mary. Oh, some of these are new to me. I haven't seen these. Well, they're different kinds of the same thing. Make yourself throw up, make yourself sick. Yeah. And of course, they're they're all derived from the uh, poison of a Gila monster. Come on, folks. This is the way they work. They take the venom of a Gila monster, which is a reptile, which has a venomous poisonous as a rattlesnake. And they uh, dilute it and manufacture it and elongate it and change it. So instead of the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea lasting for minutes, it lasts all day long or all week long. And that's how they get these new drugs, by poisoning you. Making I don't sick. understand how some of these people say they feel good when they... I don't think many of them do, Mary. No? No, 80% of them complain of being sick from the drugs. Oh, okay. And about half of them nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So the, the, the people who put these drugs out aren't fooling anybody. They say, well, it delays gastric emptying. In other words, the food stays in the stomach longer. Well, yeah. that's not so good. You leave the stomach, the food in the stomach longer, it it uh, it rots. Yeah, and, and you end up having breath like it smells like you got yeah. rotten food in your stomach. So that's the way they advertise. They say it delays the emptying of the stomach, so it keeps you full longer, uh, satisfies the 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 hunger pains. It says it just makes you sick. <laughs>
anyway, uh, here's here's the results of the GLP one, and, and it's worth noting a few things. One, they're expensive. It'll cost you seventeen thousand dollars to get the the usual weight loss, which occurs over sixty eight weeks. Okay, about a year and a half it takes you, and you've lost on average thirty seven pounds. Then you you go into a plateau. This is something they don't talk about much, but this mentioned once in a while is after the initial weight loss, you know, your body gets sick, your hunger drive responds. Hey, you can't die. You got to survive. You haven't, I'm going to make you a little sicker with these drugs. Oh no, no, you, you can't die. We got to, we got to keep you alive. And eventually we, we reach an equilibrium where the sickness from the poison equals the desire of the body to stay alive. And you reach a plateau and you don't lose any more but you're still paying the bill because if you stop these drugs, you regain the lost weight. Ugh. Okay, you can have gastric bypass surgery, bariatric surgery, that will cure fatty infiltration of the liver. And obesity. Look, your cure rates for type two diabetes are, you know, 87% are improved or resolved and 78% completely cured. And Just that little bit on the top is all the stomach you get. <laughs> That's about it. That makes it hard for the stomach, for the food to pass from the esophagus into the stomach. Oh, okay. It's a real effort for these people, Mary. You know, they're in pain. Quite often, they're uncomfortable. You know, the doc they're going, they say, tell the doctor, I want to lose some more weight. I'm not losing fast enough. The doctor pumps up the sleeve a little more. Oh. And um, I don't know. They're, 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 you know, this is brutal. And you're still hungry. Yeah. They, they, they do all these things. They cut some of the stomach out. They cut the intestines out. They uh, cut part of the stomach off and do a sleeve. They put a band around it. You're still hungry. You're starving. And of course, any way that you can lose weight, you'll cure yourself of fatty infiltration of the liver. You stop eating, have your teeth wired together. You develop a serious bacterial or parasite infection. You'll cure <laughs> You'll cure fatty liver if you lose enough weight. Take cancer <laughs> chemotherapy, you'll do it. All right, I want to go on to a couple other things. One thing that has been troubling me during my whole practice, and I'm going to bring out for you folks some of the things that I have still not answered fully the questions on, and I'm still um, trying to justify my way of practicing. So did you get away from this? Yeah, let's go. Let me get in there. All right, let's, let's see if we can get this. All right. So uh, the, the first topic has one I've dealt with, with women with breast cancer. I, I've talked to you about how estrogens promote the growth of cancer and shorten the lifespan of a woman who has breast cancer. Okay, and that's why we give a woman tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, which block the effects of estrogens. That's why we cut the ovaries off of a woman to cut the estrogens down so she will live longer. If you have your ovaries removed, you'll live longer. You know, that's why when you have the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic problems, why we see that you can do bilateral mastectomies if women don't live any longer by taking the breasts off. You take the ovaries off and they live longer. It's because estrogen promotes cancer. Well, one of the things that has troubled me during my whole practice of medicine is how about vaginal estrogens? You know, I've gotten into fights with my colleagues who have put women on estrogen pills when they had breast cancer. I told them, this is malpractice. We've gotten into some serious fights about this. They've lost. But whether <laughs> or not you should, uh, it's okay to still use vaginal estrogens so that maybe um, vaginal thinness is taken care of, maybe sexual relationships are, are more um, enjoyable, tolerable, whatever you want to call it. You know, you use these uh, applications, you put a pill or a cream inside the vagina. Does that increase your risk of dying of breast cancer? Well, let's see. JAMA Oncology, November 2nd, 2023. Keep oh, it up today. Ah, oh, yeah. People Very say, people subject. say I'm behind the lines, man, behind the times. I know I keep up with the times and I bring you all the new research. Anyways, conclusion, the results of the study show no evidence of increased breast cancer death when you use these vaginal estrogens. Oh, but, really? Yeah. And, and that's what I've well, really basically been telling women all yeah. along. Just, just like uh, well, it's been looked at whether or not vaginal estrogens increase breast cancer and those who don't have breast cancer. And the question is no. I mean, the answer is no. The research so far hasn't shown it, whereas the pills, they two and a half times the risk of breast cancer, at least wow. maybe five times. All right. So one more topic 
that's it. We'll get on with <laughs> questions. Uh, big headlines in the New York Times. Maybe it was the Washington Post. Not sure. U.S. infant mortality rate rose 3% last year. The largest increase in two decades. White and Native American infants, infant boys and babies born at 37 weeks or earlier had a significant increase in dying. You know, we have one of the worst survival of infants of any modern country. Our infant mortality is high. The reason it's high is because of the advice that dietitians and obstetricians give to pregnant women. They tell them to eat, first of all, no calorie restriction, because you know, if you restrict calories, the babies turn out too small. Okay, so we stopped doing that about 40 years ago. Now we tell you you can eat as much as you want. Well, you may gain, eat as much as you want, 40, 60, 80 pounds. And what happens when, when you gain that kind of weight is your baby doesn't fit out the vaginal canal anymore. It's too big. The vaginal canal, the birth canal is made for a five, six, seven pound baby. You're trying to push a 12 pounder or a 14 pounder through this small canal. It doesn't fit. So you have to take it out through the top. And as a result, you have a dramatic increase in cesarean sections which is associated with more mortality. These kids are born huge because of the way their mothers eat, because of what dietitians and obstetricians and gynecologists are telling them. The, the, the blame lies at their feet. They are the experts. Anyways, we haven't even talked about the genetic problems that are brought in by eating the rich Western diet due to the, uh, the, the chemicals that are in the food, you know, high on the food chain, high levels of environmental chemicals that cause birth defects. We haven't talked about the lack of the lack of folic acid, you know, folic acid foliage plants, which leads to an increased risk in trisomy 21, no mongolism. Yeah. Even in males, even in men, you find that if they eat fewer plants, they have more chance of passing on the male part of trisomy 21 to the female and having a child with trisomy 21, what do they call it? Mongolism? Down syndrome. Down syndrome, yeah. That's no, right. Mongols is the old name. Yeah. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Down syndrome. <laughs> and anyway, it's it's a tragedy to feed uh, adults the Western diet. But, you know, you get to the point where you start about children and pregnant women. Come on. Can't you get at least some emotional tinge to help these, these people just starting out in life? I don't know. Anyways, we'll we'll find a higher infant mortality rate next time they, they figure it because, because the population is getting sicker. First question, Heather. <laughs> so many questions coming in about what you've been talking about and, and other topics. So let's um, just quickly talk about um, some of the things that you brought up. So right. you prefer uh, HRT put to be in cream form rather than pill, correct? Yes, yeah, and the reason I do is because two reasons. One is when you give a pill, what happens is the pill goes into the esophagus, into the stomach, and then into the intestinal tract where it's picked up by the, the vein, the venous blood. The veins drain the intestinal tract. And these veins from the intestinal tract, they drain right into the liver. And so the estrogen that you take uh, before it goes to the rest of the body, it goes through the liver and it's rearranged into other chemical structures. Well, some, you know, were never in the original pill. There are all kinds of variations in quality and quantity of estrogen that occurs through what we call first pass kinetics. In other words, the first pass is through the liver, rearranges it. So we don't know what's, what's affecting the breasts or uterus. The other thing is, is when you give it through the skin, it's about 30 times more potent than taking it as a pill. In other words, it's, uh, you have a better chance of, of getting an effective dose when you take it through the skin. So that, that's that's why I so use- So you can use less. Yeah, you use one thirtieth as month. Yeah. So we, you know, we use like five tenths of a, of a milligram, whereas you know, you'll take a lot more when you take a pill. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I use skin creams. It's uh, in the chapter on the McDougall Program for Women, Chapter 13, under Hormone Replacement Therapy. The book's for sale right now for 10 bucks. Sometimes Heather gives it away. Who knows? Heather, you <laughs> ought to start being more generous on Friday nights and give books away. <laughs> we got lots of books. Coming up. <laughs> oh, 
holiday, holiday sale probably coming up, right? Anyway, yeah. it's, it tells you, it, I wrote a prescription out for your physicians that shows you how, them how to prescribe this because you have to get it from a compounding pharmacy, not from CVS or Rite Aid. They just put, they just put uh, bottles, big bottles with pills in them into little bottles. That's their job. <laughs> compounding ph pharmacies actually mix up things and make them for you. So you got to go to a compound pharmacy. They're doctor prescribed. I tell you how to do it in the book or in the, in the McDougal program for women. Real simple. Um, do they run into any problems with that? You could use the skin estrogens and the vaginal estrogens together if you want. Uh, you have to realize the skin estrogens, just like any estrogens, they increase the risk of gallbladder disease, increase the risk of uterine cancer, and increase the risk of breast cancer. But you're trying to balance the benefits and the risks. The benefits would be less risk of fractures when you take estrogens. You know, you've heard about osteoporosis. Well, estrogen builds strong bones. So that's a good thing. Also, the other uh, benefits that come along with taking estrogens, like relieving hot flashes, or there's a, a description women have of feeling poorly, poor feelings of well being. They don't feel good. They put them on a little estrogen. And they feel better. And that's, by the way, how you should decide whether or not you're going to take it. you got to kind of balance the risk and benefits. You know, if you have breast cancer, you go, oh, I'm not going to do it. If you have any signs of weak bones, hey, I'm, I'm going to do it. And, uh, you know, you got to you got to think about what worries you and kind of what runs in your family and where you're willing to take your risks. Because when it comes to drugs, there are benefits and there are adverse effects. Always. 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 Everything has adverse effects except for three things. <laughs> and if you keep listening to the show, you'll find out what the three things are. But I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> you going to keep us guessing? I'm going to make them tune in for the end of the show. If you <laughs> remind me know what the three things are. <laughs> they already know, Heather. We have such a, a loyal crowd. You know. We do. Okay, this is a question uh, from, from Just Facts. She's seven months pregnant and she's having awful gas and acid reflux. So she's wanting to know what she can do. It's simple. First of all, you have to get over the idea that you need a well-balanced diet to have a, a healthy pregnancy. Um, just eat very simple. Eat you know, mostly potatoes and sweet potatoes and green and yellow vegetables. Okay. Uh, gas, you want to stay away from beans, peas, and lentils. Some people say cruciferous vegetables are gassy. I've never found that. Have you found that? Broccoli? I don't think so. The beans, peas, but, and lentils. Yes, but I've heard people say that they can eat broccoli or cauliflower, mm -hmm. cabbage. Well, if you notice something bothering you, don't eat it. And then when it comes to your acid indigestion, you've got this eight-month, seven-month pregnancy pushing up on your, your stomach, and it's pushing it up into your chest. So that baby, uh, as soon as uh, he or she gets out, I think things are going to be better. But in the meantime, uh, raise the head of your bed. Okay, don't bend it. If you bend yourself, you're going to squash that baby even more. you got to do it like this. Okay, so the head's up, the feet are down. That keeps the acid out of your stomach. And then then what I would uh, I'd do, say, with all coffee, all decaf, all raw food. No raw food at all, particularly onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes. No fruit juice. You can eat the fruit. You can have the pineapple or the apple or even the lime or the lemon, but you can't drink the juice because it causes terrible indigestion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd eat the food at room temperature. I think that might help too, whether they're super cold or super hot. But those aren't as important as, uh, as what you do eat. So simple, you know, pick rice or I, I, if I would, if I was going to have a successful pregnancy, I think one of the foods I'd pick is sweet potatoes. Another would be potatoes. But, you know, I was raised in the Midwest. That's what we ate. Uh, rice is good. It's made billions of Asians. So it's good food. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I would do is try and keep yourself comfortable. As far as taking uh, drugs, I wouldn't take H2 blockers. No. Proton pump inhibitors. If they're not absolutely contraindicated on the package, they should be. This is like Prilosec and Nexium and Pravacid. You don't want to tell you, those are horrible. They're dangerous. So I would do at most, at most, 
I would take a wafer and acid like Tom's, you know, some kind of some kind of wafer and acid you like. Those last two months of pregnancy, they're tough, huh? They're tough because you just have so much pushing up on you that it's just it's hard for everybody. For everybody. So I bet it is. Yeah, yeah. Thank goodness I didn't, didn't <laughs> have the experience. But but yeah. So I'm sure Heather remembers too. Those la last two months, it's hard to get comfortable sleeping. It's hard to get comfortable anywhere. Another thing I would do is I'd eat small, frequent meals. You know, I think that would help. Eat like 14 times a day, and eat oh, eat just things you know get along with you. The starch that you need to grow that baby healthy. That's what it's looking for. It's looking for starch: rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils. You don't have to focus on more protein. That's silly. Grow just great babies on rice. Ask the Chinese. <laughs> I convinced myself that that being uncomfortable was me getting ready for childbirth. Yeah, <laughs> I was so ready to have them out. It didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question. This is from Carol. She would love to know what foods to eat to help with constipation. Oh, boy. Uh, there's a whole article in my September of 2002. I'll say that again, September 2002 newsletter called In Search of a Perfect Bowel Movement. Pretty good title, huh? Yeah, it's a good I one. Ma I made that 2002. That's like uh, 22 years ago I wrote uh. that. I was pretty clever back then. <laughs> okay, In Search of a Perfect Bowel Movement. And what it tells you is, of course, you eat a high-fiber diet. Fiber is only present in plants. There's no fiber in meat, no fiber in milk. I remember sitting in a group of dietitians one time. And a dietitian actually told me, sure, there's fiber in meat. You see that grizzly stuff? She was pointing at the tendons, you know, the the, <laughs> the connective tissue, the the you know, the, the yellowish whitish stuff that's in the muscle. You're kidding. No. And she tried to convince me that was fiber. Oh. I said, you better read again. Fiber is non-digestible sugar, which is made by plants. Only plants make fiber. So it's non-digestible sugar. So those sugars go through you and they bring in water and volume and so on. Okay, so it tells you to do that. It tells you to drink more water. It'll help you with the bowel movements. It tells you to eat more fruit, particularly prune juice or prunes. So more water, more fruit, more juices, more prunes. I know, I just told you that juice causes indigestion. We're on to another topic. We're on to constipation now. All right, so then you do things like... Uh, Miller's brand, which is just wheat bran. And then you could try things like Metamucil. Okay, you, that's been pushed for constipation and, and cholesterol. Metamucil, you know, one of those drugs you buy in the drugstore, buy it over the counter. Uh, let's see. Flat, fat, flaxseed, whole yeah. flaxseed. Yeah, that would help a lot. Flaxseed, there's a whole new dr bunch of drugs out that that uh, are particularly good for women. They're for... for uh, Irritable bowel syndrome. They're, they're, they're questioned whether they benefit, but I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the drugs. But they interfere with uh, with bowel function, and they they're, they're used to treat people who are on opioids. Okay, they're anti-opioid drugs that your doctor could prescribe. Unfortunately, they're like a thousand dollars a month. Oh, really? Yeah, it's for people who take narcotics. You know, whether they do it for medical reasons or street reasons. You're terribly constipated with narcotics. And there's a whole class of drugs that's put out now to, to negate the narcotic effects, constipating effects of these drugs. So you want to talk to your doctor about that. Your insurance company will likely pay for it. And right around the corner is the generic. You know, it'll be real cheap. <laughs> right now, they're trying to get every 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 penny of the market will bear. thousand bucks a month. Uh, let's see. We did flaxseed. Whole, not ground, yeah. whole. whole. So that, you know, and then uh, see, I think that's a lot. Oh, I know. The last thing is uh, is something called Cronulac. Uh, it is a, a cholesterol, excuse me, a bile acid binding agent. Oh. That causes constipation. Yeah, I, no, let me, re let me rethink. No, I'm giving you the wrong story. Uh, <laughs> No, you need uh, you need to have lactulose. Sorry, oh yeah, lactulose. screwed it up. Okay. It's, it's also called cronulac. That's mm -hmm. how I got mixed up. Lactulose, which is a non-absorbable sugar called lactulose, <laughs> and 
Anyways, it doesn't go into the gut. You take a couple tablespoons a couple times a day. It's doctor prescribed and it increases the volume of the bowel a lot. So when people have to have really bad constipation, they need their bowels trained. And what happens after a while is your is your bowel is like contracting out here, not in here where it's supposed to. And when it contracts out here because of the law of Laplace, which is a physics law, it doesn't create very much pressure. So you got you, you got to kind of train that bowel to start working again. Just like if you were a weightlifter, you'd 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 train the muscles in your arm so it'd be strong enough. Well, you got you you've been constipated so long, you've stretched those muscles out so much, you relied on laxatives rather than your own normal bowel function. And these muscles have become so weak, they have to be trained. And the way you train them is you start with a, a dose of cronulac, lactulose, that gives you some bowel function. And then you eat good, do the water and the fruit and the fruit juice and maybe some natural supplements we talked about. And then you slowly reduce the lactulose. You get off that and then you get off the other supplements. And, but it takes time. And those who have what we call a floppy, floppy ball. Oh, there's got to be a better name for it than that. So? <laughs> it probably has a better name. Lazy ball. How about lazy, lazy ball? ball that's they they call it lazy. I mean, they really do. That's the that's doctor term is lazy ball. Okay. I like floppy ball. <laughs> I like I like big fat weak ball. It's not fast. It's big big weak ball. Okay. Weak oh muscle. no, I like the other one better. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Is that all we want to say about constipation? <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. Okay. Let's let's move on. Next question. Oh, well, let me say something. You don't oh. have, they don't have to have a bowel movement two or three times a day. You can have a bowel movement every, you know, every three days. And that's not constipation. As long as it's soft and easy to pass. It's not explosive. It's not straining. When you strain, you get hemorrhoids. When you get strained, when you strain, you get varicose veins. You get hiatal hernias. You get prolapse of the uterus. You don't want to do all that straining on the toilet. So soft, easy to pass. You know, you can have it every three days. It's okay. You know, maybe, every, maybe three times a day. That's okay. Soft and easy to pass. Okay. Thank you. I shared the link in the chat to that article that you wrote about the perfect bowel movement. So if you want to know more, oh, you can read that. Okay, next question. Ago, okay. This is from George. He's a 75-year-old uh, male, no angina or any symptoms of heart trouble, but his doctor is suggesting that he goes to see a cardiologist for a checkup. He's been a McDougaller. Oh, so he's saying since an attack. So it sounds like he's had a heart attack. So he's wondering if he yeah. should take his doctor's advice and go see a cardiologist. Never never hurts to get information, Heather. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to act or not act on it. So I would always encourage you to get information. And then, of course, you will require you to get more information. You have to become an expert on whatever you're talking about. And you should be. This is your disease. It's you that's got diabetes or you that's got artery disease. You need to become an expert. So uh, I don't mind gathering information, but you must have your guard up because you're going to be sent to a specialist. Specialists have all these gimmicks where they make money. And so no matter how much they tell you that they're not biased or conflicted in interest, they are because they got to pay the office bills. They got to put kids on the shoes, they, sh shoes on the kids. They got to they got to pay for tuition. They are biased and motivated, just like all of us. So, you know, you got to really keep your guard up. Uh, you know, I, the way I take care of problems is I don't treat numbers. Well, I do a little bit. I give a little statin for people who've had a heart attack or bypass surgery. But in general, if you haven't had those things, and we're not sure this man has, 75, maybe he did. If he had a heart attack, I would, I'd, I'd be more inclined to put him on a statin. If he didn't, I wouldn't. Uh, if he wanted to see his numbers lower in the easiest, safest, cheapest way, I'd prescribe Birberine, B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E. -E. It's a drug that's getting a lot of publicity for diabetes and weight loss. Well, it also lowers cholesterol about 30 points. It's not been shown to reduce your risk of dying of heart disease or having a better life, but it makes the numbers look better. And I know you want that. <laughs> Statins will do that too. They don't really do much as far as prolonging life, but they make the numbers look wonderful. 
they sell a lot of drugs too, and a lot of doctors' visits and so it on. Is, it's not a prescription drug, is it? Berberino. You can buy it on Amazon. Anyway, uh, you know, like I say, I'd, I'd be real cautious. I'd go with the attitude that you're going to get out unscathed. You know, you're going to leave with, without, with, with, without, with. Just go for just, information. Yeah. Just say no. Walk out. Get out. Just say a prisoner gets at least one phone call, doesn't he or she? At least I get one phone call, don't I? I got to get out of this office. I got to go see what Dr. McDougall says about this problem. Five o'clock, Sunday night. <laughs> Next week. Pacific time. <laughs> Next week. Good, good points. Thank you. Okay, this next question is from Raina. She's watching from Bangladesh. She's 32 years old and she has iron deficiency anemia and is wondering what she can do. She also has hypothyroidism and a 12 millimeter asymptomatic gallstone, if that makes any difference. Those are interesting problems. <laughs> Well, the, the hypothyroidism needs to be, if it's truly hypothyroid and you do that by checking a TSH level, it needs to be treated with thyroid supplementation. And a uh, 1.7 centimeter stone, I think that's what you said, seven, 17 millimeters? 12 millimeters. Well, 12 millimeters, that, that big deal. It's the same. <laughs> it's just a little guy. It's only about this big. Leave it alone. Asympt unless it's causing symptoms. Asymptomatic gallstones in every research paper I'm aware of, it shows you'd be better off leaving the stones alone rather than having immediate surgery. Less risk of dying, less risk of complications if you leave the stones alone. Now, if they hurt, okay, that's another thing. And the time on a treatment for gallbladder pain is a low fat diet. So now if they don't hurt, you leave them alone. If they hurt to the point where you want to have surgery, you must realize that in half the cases of, of removal of the gallbladder, people aren't happy. They still have pain. They're still uncomfortable. Why? Because they're still eating the Western diet. You can't overcome the problems of the Western diet by taking a little gallbladder out. It's not enough. It doesn't fix the problem. And then the other thing was iron deficiency. We've been over that once at least today. You uh, you want to make sure you uh, account for any blood loss. So in a woman, you want to uh, take account of the menstrual, menstrual cycle. You want to take your account in both men and women of the bowel and consider microscopic blood loss that you don't see in your bowel movement. So you get a stool card for blood. You must, I can't emphasize this enough. Every doctor knows this. If you have anemia, you must find out why first. If you can't find out why and you've done a thorough investigation, then you can reach for the iron pills, which are rarely necessary. You know, they don't do much harm. They may increase your risk of a heart attack. They're oxidants. Iron is an, a powerful oxidant, and it may increase your risk of dying of a heart attack. It gives you black stool and constipation. But besides that, what's a little iron? <laughs> oh. do, you know how, do you know how we know that iron uh, is related to to uh, less risk of heart disease when the iron levels are low, when you have anemia, you have less heart disease. It's for two observations. One is that women who have much less heart disease than men uh, have a tendency towards a lower hemoglobin, hematocrit level. And the other thing is the people who donate blood, blood donors, who dump a pint of blood into the blood bank every period of time, they have less heart attacks. Now, it could be because people who donate blood have a, a little bit better understanding of the world around us. And maybe they make better health choices. Maybe they, they're less likely to smoke or they're more likely to eat a healthy diet. And it has nothing to do with getting rid of the blood. But, but that's one of the observations is that while well, you don't want to have too much iron, it's an oxidant. So find out the loss. Don't treat it. And then when you do treat it, you rarely need iron pills. Usually vegetable foods have enough iron to push things in the right direction. You don't have to have raisins or any other special vegetable food either. <laughs> the plants are loaded. I mean, if you needed that much iron, a plant would have that much iron. Thank you. Uh, Arlene wrote in, she's wondering, let's see, she had a titanium clip 
placed in her breast back in 2005 and is wondering if that's dangerous? Uh, I don't think you would find doctors enthusiastic about taking it out. I don't see any danger to it. You know, titanium is a rather inert metal, but, you know, I say that with some hesitation. And the hesitation I have is I had a good friend I windsurfed with for almost 15 years. And, uh, you know, Richard. Yeah. And uh, Richard had had a, a hip done, a uh, replacement, and it was done with a new hip. It was done with the metal cobalt. Well, they found out several months after Richard had his hip done that they were having uh, allergic type reactions, immune, re uh, uh, terrible inflammatory reactions against this hip. So they had to take his hip out and put in the more traditional metal. So, so titanium? Well, I don't know that it was titanium. I don't know that titanium is safe or not safe. I just think that you should be be you know, careful, suspicious. And I also want to take this time to warn you not to get in new trends. Don't become part of an experiment. Okay? You know, you'll often be enticed to, well, we have a new cancer chemotherapy regime. We'd like to try it. It's only experimental. You want to get involved? Don't do it. <laughs> Wait till they find out whether it works or not because you're very likely to end up being in the placebo group and the non-helpful group, or maybe even the harmful group. Let somebody else do it. Don't do it. You don't want to be part of an experiment. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you do, but not for your own personal health, you don't, because you're not going to end up being better off. I know you think the miracle's right around the corner. I've been in this business for 55 years. I've been looking around that corner every day for 55 years, you know, it's few and far between that that miracle shows up. Thank you. Next question, this is from Jim. He says his sister has been diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver and has been advised to eat a high protein diet because she may have PCM. What would your recommendation be? Uh, what would be PCM? I don't know, I was hoping you'd know. <laughs> See it, would be, it would definitely be a low protein diet, Heather. You know, one of the jo jobs of the liver is to break down protein into what we call blood urea nitrogen, which is just protein breakdown products. You see, to be a protein, you must contain an, a nitrogen. That's part of the definition of a molecule of protein is it has a nitrogen in it, you know, oxygen, nitrogen. You remember those things? <laughs> Iron. Periodic table, okay. Oh, it's, it's patient care management, PCM. I'd, I'd stay away from that one for sure. Controls or assigns patients to interventions across the continuum of health and illness, wellness exam, right. routine screenings. Any, anyway, the liver breaks down protein. If you can't break down the protein, then you accumulate what we call BUN. It's on your blood test. It's with your cholesterol and your sugar and your creatinine and your liver function test. It's called BUN, it's right there. And, and what happens is if the liver is sick, it can't metabolize this BUN. So you become toxic from these breakdown products of coma. It's called hepatic coma. Every doctor knows this, hepatic coma. And if you feed somebody in hepatic coma, if you switch them from animal protein to vegetable protein, they wake up. Just proving that vegetable protein is so kinder to the liver and kidneys than is animal protein. Now, I think it's a, a terrible decision to add this extra protein. The B1 will go up, the kidneys will get worse, the patient may go into a coma. This is this is about as silly as giving estrogens to somebody who has breast cancer. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you, you get a little bit of new, a little bit of truth, just a little bit, and then they run with it. They don't bother looking at the whole picture. I guess that's what happens with experience. You know, like I've told you many times, you know, I've had a lot of experience. I've been at this for 55 years. I've run uh, live-in programs for 35 years. I've taken care of 12,000 patients. Personally, well, at, least. at least, personally, I've touched them, you know. <laughs> I, I've read along the way about your problems. I've tried to figure out the solutions. So find somebody who has similar experience and then put them to the test. That's what I want you to do. 
They can brag as much as they want. They can tell you about their hunches, their hunch. Where's your data? Oh, no, I just got a hunch. Put it to the test. I'll go up against anybody, any program. And I'll win. <laughs> anyway. Okay, next question. This is from Robert. He wrote in and he says his dad has severe congestive heart failure. He's dealing with water retention and has to sleep sitting up. What would you well, recommend? He well, he's going to be he's going to be on diuretics. And he's going to be on probably digoxin, or at least when I was caring for him several decades ago. There's a new drug, Entrada. So you saw all this garbage on the TV. Entresto. Entresto. Huh. Entresto. It's a new drug that helps with heart failure. I haven't read the data on it, but I can tell you the benefits are going to be statistically significant, but probably of no real importance as far as returning the person to a quality of life that's acceptable. You don't find somebody sitting around in a chair full of fluid, having trouble breathing, that starts on these drugs, that gets out and plays two rounds of tennis. Just doesn't happen. So you've got to be realistic about what you're going to accomplish. And then underneath, as the foundation for any drugs that you do take, you eat a diet in the direction of Walter Kempner. My December 2013 newsletter shows you people in horrible heart failure. They've lost 90% of their heart muscle. And they go on the rice diet. They, they can get up. They can have an activity. They can enjoy their life and their family. Much better than any drug therapy. In my experience, I'll put it to the test. I'll put you to the challenge. <laughs> I go with rice fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. You go with Entrenzo or Digoxin or Lasix. Or... I'll use a little of that, too. I'll throw a little of that into it. I'm a real doctor. I use these things. But you got to get the food right. Can you imagine if somebody took all these drugs and the doctor says, well, I didn't learn anything about diet in medical school or residency. I think pork chops would probably be good. No, no, I got a better idea. Let's have, let's have, let's have bacon. We don't just want to have pig legs. We want to have salty pig legs. Excuse me, if you don't take care of the basic problems, the food, you know, we're talking about one to three pounds of food you're taking in every day, maybe six pounds. You're talking about taking in little peels this big. Fix the big problem first. Fix the food and then whatever you can have more good than harm done, figure out what pills might help you. But uh, it's, it's a sad sad situation where doctors know nothing about dietary therapy and they can't advise their patients on the most effective therapy there is. They are totally ignorant. And I have to tell you that omission is the same as being dishonest. Purposeful omission is dishonesty. And if your doctor is purposefully don't tell me that he or she didn't have the opportunity to learn about dietary therapy because she or he did. I learned about it. And if they don't tell you about it when you have a heart attack, diabetes, inflammatory arthritis, heart failure, et cetera, that's malpractice. It would be like, like this. If heart surgery worked, let's just assume for a minute it does. It doesn't. You know, I'll show you the eight, eight major studies that all show no survival benefit from having angioplasty. But just say it worked just like Everybody seems to believe except for the science. Just say it worked. And I, I brought a patient uh, into my practice and I just talked to him about food. I eat rice and beans. I didn't say anything about heart surgery. What do you think would happen once he or she dropped dead? Ching, ching, lawyer, lawyer. He didn't tell my husband about having heart surgery. Well, excuse me. It's just like he not the doctor not telling you about diet. It's just, it's more egregious. Someday, someday, <laughs> a doctor is going to get sued and it's going to make national headlines because she or, free, she or he neglected their patient and didn't offer them dietary therapy, which is the most potent therapy there is in terms of recovery. Put it to the challenge. Oh, I tell you. 
Thank you. Ready for the next question? Yeah. This is from Michael. He wrote in and he's wondering what would you recommend for low testosterone in an overweight older males? Let's see, 71 years old, BMI 29. Well, Heather, I have the research. So it's not like I, I can't provide the, the um, you know, the, the date, time, and letter of the research that shows that obese people have low testosterone levels. And when they lose weight, their testosterone levels go up. Multiple studies. So uh, if your concern is uh, low testosterone, or obesity, what do you think you're going to do first? You're going to get rid of the problem, the obesity, and see what happens to your testosterone. It may not be your testosterone level at all. Maybe your inability to function. Sex requires a certain ability to function physically. It's a it's a sport. <laughs> I mean, he or she or he and he or she and she, they get together and they wrestle with the ultimate outcome being possibly a pregnancy. This is a sport. you got to be in good shape. And if you're too fat to wiggle around in bed, I bet it could be that that's the problem and not your testosterone. Besides that, you know, there's something about looking good that stimulates yourself and your partner. Uh, looking good, looking healthy. You know, looking good is not just being trim. Looking good is looking healthy. We want to be with healthy people because they're more productive. Okay, they're, they're more likely to have healthy babies. They're more likely to be able to get a job and keep it and function well. Healthy people do that. Sick people don't. Overweight people and people with diabetes have half the chance of getting a job. Their, their pay scale is like 75% of what somebody without obesity and diabetes has. You are discriminated against if you're overweight. And maybe there's some righteousness to it. And you have difficult pregnancies when you're overweight. Oh, yeah, much more miscarriage. Uh, C-sections, swelling of the legs, eclampsia, gestational diabetes, constipation. Yeah, you have all kinds of problems. So, anyway, that's what you do. Now, I know you wanted to ask me about taking testosterone creams or gels or pills or whatever. Uh, they increase your risk of dying of heart disease. The literature is controversial. But I think that there's a lot of people like to hear good news about their bad habits. And so people who are on the testosterone doctor business, they want you to believe that it's going to make you into a, a sexually ravenous, libido-fulfilled person, just like you were when you were 17. Well, it doesn't work that way, <laughs> but it increases your risk of dying of heart disease. And if a woman takes testosterone, I have to pass this on. She smells like a man. <laughs> I wonder if a man takes estrogen, if he smells like a woman. I bet he does. Probably. Probably. I like, I like the way women smell. I always did. <laughs> I don't think I've changed my mind at 76 years old. I don't think so either. I like women. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mary. No, you don't sound necessary. I, I met my my my. Uh, let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Okay, next question. This is from Mary. She says she just got off levothyroxine after many years on it, and she's wondering how much iodized salt she needs to take to make sure her thyroid's okay. Hardly any. So, hardly any. I can't can't give you a milligram, but I'm sure you could look it up, and it would be like a, a couple of sprinkles of salt from a Morton's iodized salt container would give you plenty. So I, I don't think you can miss if you take any vitamins, mineral supplement that has iodine in it, or if you take any iodized salt, or likely the soil that your food was growing in is sufficient in iodine. So adding more iodine isn't gonna make the thyroid work better. This is a frustration I see in a lot of patients. They've heard that iodine is related to low thyroid. So they start eating seaweed or taking I Lugol drops, they call them Lugols. And, and they wonder why their thyroid function didn't get better. Why? Because you already had enough iodine. You had enough. Any more ain't going to do any more good. 
you know, stop trying to drive things from that direction. Rather, less is more. Get the problems fixed and then move on. But don't overfix them. Thank you. Uh, let's see, getting back to fatty liver disease, is it all fat? Or do plant fats cause this problem or just animal fats? No, no uh, plant fats, all fat. I showed you the experiment on all fat and, and omega-3 fats, which could be plant fats. They could be flaxseed oil, fish oil. So all fats. It's just like the fat you eat, the fat you wear. If I take a biopsy of your body fat, your buttocks, thigh, abdomen, I take, suck it with a needle, if I take it to the lab and I analyze it, I can tell what you like to eat. Okay, if you're heavy into uh, monounsaturated fats, olive oil, you'll be full of monounsaturated fats. If you're into Crisco's and margarines, which are trans fats, when I biopsy your belly, I'm gonna suck the fat out, I'm gonna go to the lab, I'm gonna do a spectron photometry on your fat, and I'm gonna figure out what kind of fat it is, and it's going to be trans fat, like was found in margarines and Crisco's. You eat a lot of fish. When I biopsy your fat and suck it out, you're gonna be full of fish fat, omega-3 fats when I analyze it. The fat you eat's the fat you wear in the liver and on the butt and on the thighs and on the belly. Somebody asked me whether the skin straightens out. It does a lot when you're really, really obese. Probably enough for most people, just losing the weight. But those of you who have to go on, think you need a little more. There's tummy tucks out there. Lots, lots and lots of plastic surgery to build tummy tuck on it. I remember 20 years ago when um, David, uh, Jay Leno uh, yeah. did a joke about you. Oh, yeah. With um, taking a sample of. You know, I bet Heather can find that. Buttocks um, fat. And telling, uh, it was on the yeah. Jay Leno show. So it was when Jay Leno was doing the Tonight Show. And he actually mentioned him by, oh, yeah. mentioned you he by did a, name. He did a joke about me. What it was, was we were doing the uh, United States Department of Agriculture Great Debate, which is where like 500 cameras from around the world. There were, you know, a thousand people in the audience. I was there, Ornish was there, Atkins was there, a whole bunch of people in the year 2000. And... Uh, you told that story. What happened? About... Yeah, as I told, I said, I said, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And Jay Leno said, I don't have to look at your fat. What do you say? I look at your cheeseburger in your hand or something? Like... Yeah, something like that. But then Heather, he... can you find that? that... I'll see what yeah, I can do. Yeah, I'll look for it. All right. Anyway, she says, I don't have to, I don't have to <laughs> look at your body fat. I can tell you're fat. Yeah, something like that. It was a good joke. A, a lot of people joke. laughed at yeah. it. See if you can find it. It was uh, the, about 20 years ago, Jay Leno. Yeah. Anyway, the fat you eat, the fat you wear in the liver, <laughs> on the buttocks, and the thighs, and on the abdomen, abdomen, and even your brain fat. Probably your earlobe fat. Does your brain get fat? Brain's, good. Brain's made of fat. You know, So it probably have more fat in your brain. Brain's got a lot of fat in it. Probably doesn't make you smarter, though. I've never, I've never <laughs> seen anybody try and eat fish oil to become smart, but they'll probably try it. <laughs> they'll be selling you fish oil to make you smarter. Or they, they already do. Oh, well, maybe they yeah, do. they do. They, they tell do. you fish oil stops Alzheimer's. Another bunch of nonsense that the research <laughs> says is a bunch of nonsense. Taking omega three fats, fish fats, plant fats does not stop Alzheimer's. We'll talk about that sometime in the future. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so we've you, only got one to? minute left, so I, I don't think I'll be able to fit another question in. Well, then why oh, well, well, now you can tell them the three things. What's that? Oh, good. Well, well, there are three things them, that well. have no side effects, no you negative have no oh, no side, side effects. effects. You were going right, to so say that come the end. All right, there are only three things that have no side effects. In other words, everything's positive. And they're clean air, clean water, and clean food. I believe the McDougal program teaches you clean food. Now, Heather, what are you going to be doing over the next couple of months <laughs> if these people would be interested? Because they got a bunch of friends that have, I mean, 25% of them have fatty infiltration of the liver right out there in the general population. You know, half are pre-diabetic, 80% are overweight or obese. What are these people going to do to help their friends and loved ones? 
Come on, Heather, tell well, me. Well, they've got two options. They can either tune in every Sunday night at 5 p.m. Pacific and get their questions answered, or they can enroll in our January 12-day online program and start their medical care now. So two options. Yeah. That's a nice and thing. You gave them the information about how to make a healthy Thanksgiving, correct? Yes, that mailing just went out. So start shopping, get your get your meal planning ready. Yeah. Thanksgiving is one of the easiest holidays to do McDougal style, I think. Oh, it is. It is. So as a final note, I want to say this shirt, which is yeah, potatoes. Up a little straighter so you this can shirt, see the potato. Which is potatoes, came to be courteous of Chef AJ, whose show I'll be on tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Probably be a lot of the stuff you've already heard, but eh, come on, I have a good time. 10 o'clock Pacific time, Monday morning. Was it the 6th? The I don't know. I guess. Yeah, the 6th. Yep, tomorrow's the 6th. 10 a.m. So, Pacific. Chef Chef AJ's show. Show. Just look it up. And then, of course, we'll be here next Sunday night. All going Thank well. You. And we're going to run a program in January. And we have a five- a uh, five two-hour series of lectures that we're making available to people. So we, we're, yeah. we're still working. We're still working. Well, thank you all for tuning in. It was a great hour. See you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Thanks, Dr. McDougal and Mary, mom and dad. Thank, great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're a, a good hostess. And you allowed me to get a lot of stuff in this time, I'll tell you. Yeah, you yeah. did. So thank you for it was fun. Presenting the questions in a manner that we could move right through them. All right. Good okay. enough. See you next week, folks. Thanks, everyone.